Hi, this is George Fairbanks. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about technical debt. We can't avoid it entirely, but we can understand how it arises. And by doing so, we can keep it under control. This is a picture of one of the oldest Roman roads. You can see the ruts in it from countless wagons and carts that have traveled there over the years. Why did the ruts happen there and not an inch to the right or to the left? Well, when the rut started, it was hard to avoid, and so other wagons that came along were sucked into the rut that existed. It's not that those ruts are an ideal place to be for the carts, it's that once the ruts exist, they're hard to escape. Today, most teams follow a software development process that seems similar to those carts in a rut. The longer they work on a program, the worse their technical debt becomes. New features aren't elegantly incorporated they feel bolted on to the existing system. Over time, the elegance and simplicity that the system might have had decline, and the code becomes harder to maintain. Eventually, teams declare bankruptcy, and they rewrite the entire program, hoping that this will be different. But actually, bankruptcy just renews the cycle, because they haven't changed the conditions that led them to tech debt and bankruptcy in the first place. They're still in the rut. So my question is, does this rut sound familiar to you? What we're hoping is that as we spend more and more time, more and more effort on our programs, those programs get better and better. That is, for whatever problem they're trying to solve, we're approaching some ideal fit between the program and, and uh, the problem we're trying to solve. But that's not what I find happening all too often. Instead, uh, we make some progress and make our program better, but because the technical debt starts to pile up, every increment of effort that we put into the program as we bolt on more features and don't really address the technical debt, we actually end up making the program worse over time. Now, it's definitely the case that some teams manage to do what we see on the left. We all know examples of those. But we probably, if you're listening to this talk, have been on teams or have seen teams where more effort actually makes the program worse. And so what we'd like to do is understand why that happens and see if we can change those conditions. In this talk, I'm going to describe to you a way of getting out of the rut. And in order to do that, you're going to have to change your software development process. I have personally had success with a particular technique, which I'm going to tell you about, called design-focused iterations. But this isn't a talk with one weird trick to, to cure your technical debt. Instead, it's a way of looking at technical debt that allows you to make better decisions. You can decide what the right answer is for you. So let's understand how iterations cause technical debt so that we can minimize that. In order to do that, we're going to have to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. So let me do a quick review of software processes so that when I say waterfall or incremental or iterative, we're both talking about the same thing. In a waterfall process, uh, a team will handle all the requirements at once. That is, they collect all the requirements in the first phase, uh, and then in another phase, they may analyze those requirements, proceeding then to designing a system that will handle all those requirements, writing the code for that whole system, testing it, and deploying it. There aren't any intermediate deliverables, and it's hard to anticipate all requirements. So we end up uh, not really doing a great job of hitting the target that we were expecting to. Also, uh, because you have so many requirements you're analyzing, you end up with relatively slow delivery. So that's why waterfall processes were more common because we see them in building things like bridges, uh, but it didn't make as much sense for software. So we've switched to uh, an iterative process. But in between, we find uh, another process called incremental. And it is the same as waterfall in many respects in, it, in that it has to look at all the requirements, but the one change that it makes is that it delivers parts of the system incrementally, but not the whole system. That is, you can't actually, in this diagram, drive one wheel or two wheels. You have to wait until you have the whole car. So the interesting thing to note here is that you must have a full design before you build that first part. Otherwise, that part won't fit in the, the final system. And then finally, we come to iterative processes. And these are what most teams follow today. They consider just a few requirements and they deliver a working system based on those requirements. Now, because they haven't looked at all the requirements, they don't know where they're gonna go yet. That is, they haven't looked at the car requirements at the end. And so reworking the system is inevitable. 
For example, if you take a look at that skateboard, those wheels will not fit on the bicycle or the motorcycle or the car. So we're gonna to have to go back and revise those. But the big advantage is that you can get started faster. You can deliver something of at least some value to your customers and you can change course if they change their mind or if you learn more about the problem. So in recapping, there's no refract refactoring in a waterfall process. You just set out to build a car, you design it in, in full and you deliver it in full. With an incremental process, you do the same thing when it comes to analyzing the requirements and designing things, but instead of delivering it once, you have a bunch of incremental deliveries. Uh, this is often done, for example, if you have several teams working in parallel and they're building different parts of it, they may deliver those parts, but the whole system doesn't work until everything comes together. And then finally, we've got iterative process. It processes. And the most important thing to notice here is that the parts that you build in early iterations, you shouldn't have any expectation that you can reuse those later because you haven't uh, looked at the requirements and so you don't know what kind of parts you need for the final car. One thing I've noticed, however, is that a lot of teams today say that they're doing an iterative process. They intend to do an iterative process. That, that is, they intend to revise the artifacts as they go along but they actually feel so compelled to reuse the existing parts, say those small wheels on the skateboard, that they actually are following a different process, one I call a sedimentary process. And the reason I call it a sedimentary process is because if you look through the code, like an archeologist, like Indiana Jones, you can see the evidence of old designs in the code that were never really reworked and we sort of cobbled them together into what we want. And it definitely works. This kind of system will get you going uh, and it continues to provide value, but it produces strange and distorted systems. So I found a couple other pieces of clip art from the, uh, the internet, and this is a very strange bicycle with very tiny wheels. Uh, the next is a motorcycle with a giant front wheel, but still with tiny little wheels in the back. And then finally, a car with distorted small wheels. All of this is trying to reinforce the idea that the code that you wrote in early iterations it was just fine for the requirements that you knew about. But as you add more requirements, as you try to build more things, if you don't embrace the idea that you need to re-engineer those existing things that you built, then you start having distorted systems that don't really make any sense, that no sane person would have built that way. So the takeaway lessons from this section are that iteration leads to technical debt. It's just a natural thing that happens when we start coding before we've seen all the requirements. We can't avoid this rework, refactoring, and rewriting of existing code. Yet, uh, despite all that, doing iterations are faster and better than waterfall. Uh, you just have to commit to doing the rework, which is tough to do. A lot of times teams decide they're gonna set out on an iterative process, but they don't do the necessary rework uh, for a lot of different good reasons. And they end up with a sedimentary process where if you go look at their code, you find weird distorted things that wouldn't be there if they'd looked at all the requirements <clears throat> at, from the beginning. It turns out that we can improve the situation. This is a bit of foreshadowing by focusing on different things. And uh, right now we focus on features. And if we change our focus to take a look at the design, we can end up changing this cycle. So let's take a look at the focus uh, within our iterations. It turns out that we don't have a choice between features and design. It's not like one team can be building features and the other team can be just designing things. Because of course, we need to design a system and we need to build it. Any process that's viable in the long term has to do both. So what I'm gonna show you here is that what we pay primary attention to which in, within each iteration is very important, has a big impact on how we end up. And so let me introduce two metaphors to make this really clear. The first one is a library, and the second one is the game of pool. Here's a picture of the Trinity College Library in Dublin. Uh, it's beautiful. I mean, that's the first thing you notice. It's a piece of history. Uh, look at all those old leather wrapped books. But as you gaze at this a little bit longer, you'll notice something a bit different compared to most libraries you're used to. The books are packed in very tightly. There's almost no gap above each book. That's because this library is organized by the size of the books. 
this was a natural consequence. Some of the oldest libraries in the world uh, have had towns that grow up around them, and it's just not possible to expand the size of the library. So in order to keep the books in there, they've organized the library by the size of the book. Now, the consequence of that, of course, is that you can't put all the books on the same topic on the same shelf because there's no guarantee they're going to be the same size. So the topics are scattered around while the books are organized by size. <clears throat> This is a typical library that I find in the United States. And because we've just been talking about this, your attention will have jumped to the fact that the books are <clears throat> of different sizes on the shelves. In fact, the shelves seem to have pretty uniform sizes. Uh, but the advantage for us is that they can put all the books on a certain topic in the same place. So as I walk over to that shelf, I see uh, a bunch of books on the same thing. And what I want you to notice here is that each of these libraries has a dominant decomposition and different ones. The Trinity College Library is decomposed primarily by the size of the books, where in the second library I showed you, it's decomposed first by the topic of the book, okay, and then the, perhaps the size second. And there are trade-offs between these decompositions. The thing to notice is that if you generalize this, all kinds of systems have a dominant decomposition and that we are showing you uh, libraries here because those are just a particularly easy example to see the dominant decomposition. And why are we talking about this? Because as you might imagine, uh, software processes have a dominant decomposition too, and that has a big impact on the kind of software that we end up building. In the 20th century, most teams were following a waterfall process, and the focus there was on the system's design. It was a holistic perspective. You were thinking about all the requirements. You were analyzing all the requirements. You're building a design that satisfied all the requirements. And you were thinking about things like simplicity, elegance, clarity, consistency in that design. Didn't always hit all those targets all the time, but certainly the process guided you towards activities uh, that had you think about those. Now, we changed processes, uh, let's say about 20 years ago. We primarily started uh, working on iterative software processes. Sorry, uh, yeah, iterative software processes. And the focus there is on a stream of features. It's an incremental perspective because as you get a new feature, you're looking at the existing relatively large system compared to the delta, the, the, the incremental feature or request that you're going to add to it. Developers think about the life cycle of that uh, feature uh, that may be through the week or during the iteration and the set of patches or code changes that they're going to make and whether those have been out for review and whether they've been approved and whether they've gone into production. So the big thing to notice here is that the processes have a dominant decomposition and they guide our thinking either towards the holistic design or towards the increment. Okay. Today, features are dominating things and it's easier to build features and it's harder to keep technical debt down. And that's the punchline. Uh, now, this is not to say that we should return to waterfall processes. Uh, now, the thing here is that I've painted a pretty black and white picture here uh, about uh, waterfall focusing on the design and iterative processes focusing on features. And the truth is a little more subtle because as you know, uh, if you think about this, of course, uh, in uh, waterfall systems, we were thinking about building the features. And of course, in iterative processes today, we are thinking about the design. So it's not like you can't do both, it's just that it's a challenge to do both. So time for a second metaphor that makes this pretty obvious. When I was an undergraduate, <clears throat> some buddies of mine uh, and I would go down to the student union and we'd play pool, generally pretty poorly. And uh, the game of pool uh, works that there's a bunch of balls on a big table like you see here, and uh, you have to hit the white ball called the cue ball into a second ball, knocking it into one of the pockets in the corners. And when we were no good at, at pool, all we were focused on was, <clears throat> can we hit the cue ball and sink one of those balls into one of the pockets? Okay, that's all we thought about. But then as we got better at that, we had a gradual awareness that where we left the cue ball at the end of that first shot <clears throat> would uh, determine how well we were gonna be able to hit the second shot. So once we had that realization, we started trying to position the cue ball for the second shot. And that, that would make things easier, we thought. But it turns out, in trying to do that second thing, we actually hurt our ability to sink that first ball. 
Okay, and so while we were struggling to do this, uh, we actually regressed on our ability to do that first thing well. Now, uh, for some of us, not really me, uh, they got better at this and they could actually do a good enough job at sinking the first ball. And then they were still thinking about the second thing, this where do, I, where do I leave the cue ball? That is a kind of mastery. And, and when you reach that kind of mastery, you can keep these two perspectives in mind at the same time and execute them both well. So when we think about these decompositions, the library had a hard decomposition. You, were, you either organize the shelves by size or by topic. It's really, it's a, it's a choice you have to make and you can't sort of do a little bit of each. Now with pool, there's a different situation. You definitely have a, a, a dominant decomposition, which is sinking the first shot, because if that doesn't happen, then you know your turn is over. But with mastery, you can actually balance two perspectives. And I think this is much closer to what's going on in software development, that we have to think about uh, we have to be focusing first on our feature delivery, but with mastery, we can think about the design. So what we are able to do with mastery is balance design and feature work. And this is what a lot of the agile folks have been saying since the very beginning. I'm pointing this out because it's so easy to get this wrong. And in fact, many of us uh, don't do it very well. We fail to recognize that we need to do both. That's the first thing. Some people think they can just focus on the features, do a little bit of refactoring, and everything's going to be fine. And we're, we're finding out that that doesn't work so well. And the second thing I've noticed is that when I introduce the idea that we need to balance both of these and that you need to gain mastery over both of them, I find people giving up in the middle when they try to do some design and they find out that their feature delivery uh, was harder than they expected. And so they give up and they return back to the easy, just first step thing. So we got to get the balance and we have to figure that out. Now, I want to point out uh, a danger because the only thing, it's not the case that the only thing that we're doing is features in design. In fact, there's another force that's being put on us all the time. Uh, we're always trying to become more productive. And let me think about that in terms of uh, as I move uh, features into production, it would be great if I could move them into production a little bit uh, faster than I did yesterday with a little less drama than I did yesterday and so forth. So there's always this other hand uh, that's pushing on our teams uh, to keep getting more work done. And I want to point out that the feature work that we're doing is incredibly tangible. No one is going to uh, miss uh, whether you shipped that feature this week or you didn't ship that feature, right? That's very, very clear. Uh, but things like is your design still clean? Is your tech debt building up? Is your design elegant? Uh, have you found the simplicity in the problem that could be there? Is your code clear? And so forth. And it looks like I've got elegance twice in that list. That's how important it is. Uh, these are intangible things. And so as this hand of trying to be more productive is pushing on the team, you may find that the tangible things, which are measured and easily visible, stay. Right? We're still, we continue to be very good at delivering those things. But then the intangible stuff that's critical for us to keep going actually gets squeezed out. So just watch out for that one. So the takeaway lessons here are that iterative processes make it easy to focus on the incremental features that we're building and hard to focus on the holistic design. And potentially over time, design gets squeezed out, letting technical debt accumulate. Now, I hate to be talking about software development processes, but the real answer here, a real observation here, is that it's our actions in the code that lead to technical debt. And if we want less technical debt, we have to change those actions. We have to change our process. And I'm going to talk to you about a way of doing that, of balancing features and design by changing what we focus on. Any successful team balances features and design. We're going to talk about a way of developing software, also known as software development processes. And that sounds boring. So I'm going to try to make it a little bit more interesting because I'm going to phrase it as an algorithm discussion. And let's talk about uh, making that connection between algorithms and software development processes very clear. What is garbage collection? Garbage collection is a kind of algorithm. Uh, when you have a running program, it creates garbage, that is allocated but unused memory. And garbage is unavoidable in many languages, right? Like Java, for example. Occasionally, that program needs to pause to collect the garbage. 
and predictability is nice there. Nobody likes it when the garbage collector pauses unpredictably or it pauses for a very long time. And there are various garbage collection algorithms and those algorithms have different properties. So this is something that I hope you would recognize as this is garbage collection and there are gar garbage collection algorithms. Here's the interesting thing. Technical debt occurs when we run an iteration of our software development process and that creates technical debt. That is working code with an obsolete design where the design hasn't kept up with the code. The technical debt is unavoidable based upon us using an iterative process. Occasionally we have to pause to refactor the code but predictability is nice. It would be nice if we knew when we were going to be refactoring and it didn't take an enormous amount of time and instead it was, it was smaller and more predictable. So there are various software development processes, software design processes, and they have different, pro different properties. This uh, big idea came from Leon Osterweil. Uh, his paper on software processes, our software too, was from 1987. Now, he didn't talk about garbage collection or technical debt, but what he pointed out was that our processes that human beings run inside of our teams, those things are software. They're just software that doesn't run on a machine. It's software that runs on a, uh, on a, on a team, right, on humans. And that's a bit of a jump. And when you get used to it, though, you can think about our technical debt problems, I think, a bit more clearly. Because if we improve our software development process, we are really implementing a better tech debt algorithm, just like someone might implement a better garbage collection algorithm. Today, I find that teams are using one of three broad categories of technical debt algorithms, that is processes for keeping your technical debt down. Uh, that is some kind of upfront design, some kind of alternation where you go back and forth between feature delivery activities and design activities. And finally, the one I'd like to focus on, which is design focused iterations. Upfront design includes things like a waterfall process, which you know, we've, we've uh, said is probably not a good idea, but some people do that. They do the, all the design upfront. Another variation that people do is using what they call iteration zero. Uh, really, that's a, a mini waterfall at the beginning of the project where you do a bunch of design work uh, before you then switch to an iterative process. And the characteristics of upfront design are they're very good at avoiding the creation of technical debt because, for example, the design makes more sense. You don't have to fix as much things. Um, but it's not a process for removing technical debt. That is, once the technical debt does arise, upfront design doesn't tell you how to get rid of what exists. And that's different in this second broad category, the alternation. So uh, when you alternate between feature building and design activities, uh, you actually have a situation where uh, you are creating technical debt, but you are scheduling work to remove it. Uh, there are two examples that I know of about this that you may have heard about. Uh, that is uh, Philippe Cruchen's multicolor backlog and the red-green refactor pattern. Let's take a look at each of those. Philippe Cruchen's multicolor backlog says that most teams currently have just a, a, a backlog of features that we are waiting to build and that you schedule those features. But uh, he says, actually, you should consider four categories. You should consider those features, of course, but also bugs. And I think most teams do schedule bugs, although they don't think about that in the same way. Um, but then there's also invisible things. Uh, like an architectural feature that you would like to build, uh, you should put that on your backlog. And then, of course, technical debt, which is problems in the code <clears throat> that you've identified and you'd like to fix. So if you schedule all four of those kinds of work, those really are an alternation between building new features and doing design work. Another pattern that is very, very small, you might do this uh, dozens of times a day, is the red-green refactor pattern that comes from test-driven development. The idea is when you have a new feature to build, you write a test for it, and of course the test fails because there's no code for it. Then you implement uh, the code to make the test pass. Yay, that's when your test turns green. And then you immediately refactor the code, okay? You clean things up so that it makes you look like uh, the, the system makes sense. Now, this is very uh, good uh, for refactoring in the small, uh, but really, as you might imagine, you've only, you're talking about like an hour's worth of work here. Uh, you won't have time to do large scale refactorings on your program. 
So the final category here is design focused iterations. And the best example I have of this is Kent Beck's rule about making the change simple. We'll see more on that in a minute. The characteristics here are that it does two things. It minimizes the amount of te tech debt that you create. And once you've created it, it guides you towards fixing uh, the code that's, uh, that's broken. So let's take a look at uh, both of those and, and see how that works. The big idea here is that we flip what the dominant decomposition is inside of our iterations. That is, we keep doing iterative design, iterative software development. We use an iterative process. And we keep doing both features and design. But instead of having the features be the first priority that we pay attention, we make the features the second priority. Our problem that we are facing, uh, at least most teams are facing, isn't the feature velocity. That is, we have pretty good feature velocity. The problem that we have is technical debt buildup. And so what we can do to change that, we can change the amount of tech debt that builds up if we make the design our primary focus. Now, what I've said here might seem like a linguistic trick, like a little language trick of like, oh, let's just make that our primary focus. That'll solve the problem. So let me uh, express that in terms of algorithmic changes, because then it'll uh, become more clear about why uh, this makes a difference. Here's an example of a process that many teams are following, and it's, it's a zoomed way out. But the first step is you get a new requirement, then you write a test case for it, you edit the code so that the test passes, and then you do some refactoring to remove duplication or some, some small refactoring. This is very similar to the red-green refactor pattern that we just saw. And let me contrast that with a design-focused iteration. You would get a new requirement, you would take a look at your design, and say, is it necessary for me to revise the design? Okay. For example, like if you're building a client server system, does that new requirement challenge the idea of you've got a client and a server? Or do you suddenly need to do asynchronous work in the background, which isn't client server? Or uh, with the new requirement, does it introduce a challenge to the way that you understand the domain? So for example, you might uh, have a system where customers have a single address and the new requirement uh, has the customers have a, a separate billing address from a shipping address, okay? And that might challenge your domain model. So step number two is, is different here, and it says, go take a look at your design and figure out if everything's okay. Third step is the same, or as you write the test case for things. And then the fourth step is a little bit different, that you revise the code to match the design. OK, so we instead of uh, refactoring at the end, OK, instead of implementing the feature and then doing some refactoring to clean up the technical debt, what you're doing here is you're identifying up front that there is now technical debt. Now that you've seen this new requirement, you know the system is not working the way that it, it's going to need to work for this new requirement. You go ahead and you redesign before you write the code. So this avoids the situation where we have features that look bolted on because <clears throat> we have revised the code to before we get there. So let's take a look at what Kent Beck said. He said that for each desired change, make the change easy. Warning, this could be hard. Then make the easy change. And this is what I think he's talking about. Both Ward Cunningham and Tech, uh, uh, sorry, Ward Cunningham invented the tech debt metaphor three decades ago, and he and Kent Beck were buddies back at the company Techtronics. So these guys have been buddies for a long time. The two that I'm talking about most in this presentation. Um, most of the time, it's easy to add features, uh, but sometimes it's not, and that is what Kent is talking about here. Sometimes your design is completely ready uh, to to put a new feature in, but when it's not you can do the revisions before you write the feature. That avoids the sort of bolt-on effect. Now, feature-focused iterations is kind of an oversimplification. Um, not all of our prevention and cleanup can be incremental. We know that. Like, if I get a new requirement and I go, wow, I really got something wrong, uh, you may end up bolting on a feature temporarily and then scheduling a the tech deck to fix it. But I have been impressed with how well uh, focusing on their design early on uh, has been able to change the amount of tech debt that builds up. So here's my experience. And these are, these are concrete things that I've done uh, on teams that uh, I have found that uh, this has a way of focusing us on the design early and uh, keeping tech debt low. The first thing is to encourage different experimentation because you don't want to get locked into the first way you solved some problem. And the distinction is 
if you find that an experiment uh, works out really well, like you, you find a new way of saving things to the database or a new way of encoding something, great. Uh, but you have to drive that to consistency because you don't want to have the code to have a mixture of mechanisms, like the old way we used to do it and the new way we do it, okay? Uh, so this matches up with uh, what Ward Cunningham says. He says, you got to try to make the code look like you knew what you were doing the whole time. And the only way you can do that is by uh, experimenting, but then if you agree with the experiment, push it all the way through. The second is uh, that multicolor backlog that we, we saw just before, not just a backlog of features. That seems fairly straightforward. Uh, focus on all the things, not just the features. During standups, we did something different. We used the standups as a way to communicate changes between developers. The goal was that we all had the same design in our head and we we're telling each other. So for example, if I get stuck and I'm working on something for more days than I expected, that's probably because the design that we came up with didn't work out like we expected. Maybe the API doesn't work the way I'd hoped. And so what I need to do is I need to signal that to other people and say, hey, pay attention, the design is changing over here because most days it isn't changing, but over here it is. And then finally, we were insisting that our code aligns with our mental models. If you do that uh, every single day, you're noticing uh, the, the delta and you find the code is drifting down, right? It's not really aligning with the language that the team is using. And one example we had was our test setup for our, our test cases got bigger and bigger and more convoluted and, and it didn't express the way that we were thinking about the test setup. It was much more verbose. What did we do? We created a very small domain specific language uh, for creating our, uh, our, our, our situations, uh, the, the test setup. And as a result, uh, our code was speaking back our mental models to us. So in the original paper, where Ward Cunningham described technical debt, he summed it up this way. He said, it was important to me that we accumulate the learnings that we did about the application over time by modifying the program to look as if we'd known what we were doing all along. And this idea is very important to me. His manager liked getting features quickly, but he resisted the idea of re re revisiting existing code. That's probably the situation you're in right now too. What Ward is pointing out here is, if we build uh, using an iterative process, the natural consequences, a lot of things are gonna get bolted on and they look like we didn't know what we were doing because guess what? We didn't know what we were doing. That was because we picked up requirements one by one as we went along. The only way we're gonna have a program that looks sane, that looks like we knew what we were doing all along is if we do that uh, extensive refactoring, that redesign uh, that's necessary. I mean, we took the payoff right up front, we got to go fast and what we have to do in order to keep going is to keep doing that refactoring. So the takeaway lessons here is that first, tech debt creation is kind of like garbage creation, okay? And we're used to garbage collection algorithms. It's a neat change of perspective here to think, my team is following an algorithm and that algorithm today, perhaps you might look at your team and say, we're generating more tech debt than I'd like. The answer is to re-examine that algorithm, okay? There is no single weird trick that's gonna solve the problem, but if you look at the algorithm, you can predict what sort of consequences are gonna happen. Teams follow three basic algorithms today for balancing features and design. They may design up front, they may alternate between feature and design activities, or they can do what I've suggested here and what Kent Beck suggested, which is move the design to before the implementation. And there's really an opportunity to improve our tech debt algorithms, if you think about it that way. Two main ways. First, you could create less debt up front, that is, uh, make uh, less clunky programs so that they don't have to be revised later. And second, is to make sure that you direct your attention, schedule the activities to fix the debt that does exist. Now, I can imagine many people have heard what I've said and I've tried to predict some of the objections. So let me go through those really quickly. The first is that uh, teams may say, but we're refactoring already. Uh, and I would say, please don't stop refactoring. Of course, that's a great idea. Um, but the question you have to ask yourself is, again, look at the algorithm for your team. What is it that you're doing perhaps that is making your tech debt pay down not work as well as you'd like? Uh, one thing that I've seen is that some teams will do some refactoring, but they only do the like localized refactoring, like uh, refactoring to remove duplication. Or maybe it's the case that you're just 
cranking away at features and you're creating tech debt too fast, uh, you're not uh, scheduling enough time. Uh, so it's just that it's not that your pay down activities are a problem. It's that you're uh, going really hard on, on feature creation and therefore tech debt creation. The second objection I hear people uh, say is that our feature delivery will slow down. Uh, they may say this in terms of analysis, paralysis, or endless redesign or endless polishing. And my first answer to this is that low quality code is not the answer to getting feature velocity, right? Um, and so people still have this uh, tension. Uh, they go, but, but, but we can't afford this high quality code and this good software engineering that you're talking about. Now, if we really recognize that low quality code is what's causing the tech debt and it's slowing us down, and the reason you're listening to this lecture is we're already in that situation. The tech debt is hurting our velocity already. There's not really a tension between these two things. In the reference and section, there's a couple articles by Martin Fowler that are really great. And he shows how we're used to having a trade-off between quality and cost, like more expensive things cost more. And he goes to explain why when it comes to software development, buying the cheap stuff really, really hurts us. And I think that you will see that when you, if we build a lot of tech debt, we're, we're only helping ourselves in the short run. The other thing I'd say here is that there are very strong incentives for teams to ship features. Of the two things that we have to do, get the design right, ship the features, the one really strong incentive is shipping the features. So uh, if your team shifts its focus to design, it's highly unlikely they're gonna forget to sh ship features, right? Like everybody's incentives are aligned to get those features out the door. And finally, the, the third objection I hear is that really that this is just waterfall or big design up front. And that, that design focused iterations are a waterfall in design, uh, in disguise. I would say, I don't think that's the case. Um, when you look at what waterfall does, it looks at all of the requirements and then designs for them. What I'm suggesting here is iterative. It looks at the requirements one at a time. It just says, as you pick up that new requirement, realize you may, may, need, may need to redesign what you've already got. So don't design everything. Don't design up front. But as you incrementally get things, don't forget to do the design. Do the design before you bolt on the feature. OK, so in conclusion, let me sum up what this talk is all about. <clears throat> The most important thing I want you to take away from this talk is that your team may be in a rut. The rut is the software process that you're following. That is the algorithm that is generating tech debt on your team. If we understand that problem and if we understand it as an algorithm problem, then we can do a better job. Uh, we can look at a different algorithm or how to tune our existing algorithm so that we get uh, the characteristics that we want and that I believe you can break out of the rut. Getting out of the rut means changing the way you're doing your software development today. That is the algorithm that you run on your team. I've had success with design focused iterations, but this isn't a talk about the one weird trick to cure your technical debt. <clears throat> Instead, I'm hoping that you now look at tech debt in a different way, a way that helps you make better decisions. Many teams are following the ruts in the road and they're not thinking carefully about their process. In fact, many teams are just doing what uh, other teams are doing around them. They look left, they look right. People are doing iterations, they're following uh, DevOps practices and so forth. Many of these are very, very good. But the question is, are those practices being considered by the team? Are they really thinking about them? I think if you do think about those practices and you do think about the tech debt problem you have, you're going to be able to tweak your algorithm and maybe design focused iterations will be the right answer for you. I want to leave you with two quotes that we already saw. The first was from Ward Cunningham, because these two quotes I think are very important. The first big idea is that Ward's observation here, that iteration without refactoring leads to a big mess. The only way the code is ever going to make sense is if we go back and, and refactor it to make sense. That's just the natural consequence of doing iterative development. And the second quote is Kent Beck's advice, which I think on its own is pretty cryptic, but I hope through the explanations here today, you can see that he's suggesting when you have changes to make, try refactoring the code before you implement the feature. You may find that works way better for you. And here are some references that I found very helpful. Uh, the talk today was written based upon a series of uh, essays that I wrote in IEEE software. So if you want more details, those are there. The two Martin Fowler uh, essays that uh, I referenced about design quality, I find these two very good. 
There are the two original papers on technical debt from Ward Cunningham. Uh, both of these are tiny. They're like 700 words each. And uh, I've always been inspired by the big ball of mud paper. It talks about the forces on a team that push us into the situation where we create mud, we create technical debt. So with that, thank you very much.